so uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, this is my first time, first trip to to Reno. Uh, I have been to Italy to many other cities, but this is the first time I'm in Turin. I really like it. This morning, I had some time to walk in the city. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Very, very impressive. Um, so I would like to thank uh, Giovanni, thank uh, to the department uh, that uh, I have the opportunity to come here to exchange with you on EU-China relations. Um, I hope that by taking this lecture, uh, you can get to know something that you didn't know before 2 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> um, so what I would like to say today is uh, EU-China relations. And you know EU-China relations is a very, very big topic. Uh, Giovanni just said that I have been in Brussels for a long time. Indeed, the advantage uh, in Brussels is that it's very close to Schumann. And Schumann is the location where all the European institutions are situated. And so whenever there are some uh, new policies, new uh, documents, press conferences, and then we get to know very, uh, very rapidly. So that's the advantage that we can follow very closely. And then the, advantage, the other advantage for the College of Europe, uh, as a professor of College of Europe working in Belgium, is that the College of Europe is very widely networked. So networking is all important. As Italians, you know how important it is. And everywhere, network is important. Um, in, um, in our alumni association, we have about yeah, more than 10,000 uh, graduates from College of Europe and about 4,000, 5,000 working in EU institutions. Uh, some of them, of course, retired and some are still there. And currently, I think there are 2,000 working uh, there. So it's, uh, it's really important that you can uh, really feel the pulse, I would say, feel the pulse of the European Union and then feel how the EU and China interact with each other. Uh, so today, what I would like to tell, I, I think I will need the microphone okay, uh, okay. so that I can move turn on, yes. like this. Like I will, this. I will turn up. Turn up. Yes. Hello? Hello? Yes. Okay. okay, it's on now. Because I need to um, regulate my PPT here, so I would like to move. And so what I would like to tell today um, is to look at the nature of the relationship with you together, to see whether they are partners or competitors, how uh, particularly China perceives the European Union. Um, let me see. Hmm? I only have one. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, it's here. It's here. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay, you yeah, faster. Um, so this is my presentation. And what I would like to see together with you, first of all, we have to uh, have a review of the EU's policy uh, towards China, and then I will give you an introduction of how the EU tries to promote uh, cooperation with China uh, in the past years, and then uh, China's policies on the EU, and then we need to give an analysis of the relationship, and then we will conclude by how China perceives the EU. So first of all, the review of EU's policy, uh, policy papers. And you need to know, what you need to know is that by far, the European Union has published a number of policy papers on China, and the first one was only published in 1995. I would say only published because, you know, uh, the EU and China, when was the EU founded? The EU was founded not such a long time ago, but the first diplomatic relationship uh, established between China and not the EU, but the European Community. And that was in 1975. So the first time that they came together to uh, establish diplomatic relationship, that was in 75. And that's why I said only in 1995, the EU published its first policy paper on China. So it means that the EU waited for 20 years 
for 20 years before the first policy paper was produced. But of course, you could ask, how about China? Whether China published a policy paper on the EU? <laughs> and when was that? And then I can tell you that China only published its first policy paper on the EU in 2003. <laughs> in 2003, even later. So the EU took the initiative, let's say, even 20 years uh, later after diplomatic relationship was established, the EU took the initiative to publish a paper on China. And what is interesting, although it was the first policy paper, as I said, it waited for 20 years, and then the title of the policy paper is A Long-Term Policy for China-Europe Relations. So you could see that from the European perspective. The EU or the European community would like to develop a long-term policy, a long-term relationship. Why? Because around that time, around that time, the uh, Chinese, I would not say the Chinese, but more specifically, let's say more generally, Asian economy was developing rapidly. Japan, South Korea, Southeast Asian countries, the four uh, small uh, tigers or dragons, you call it. And then around that time, uh, Asian market became very attractive to the Europeans. And that's why the European community said, well, we should look to the East, East market. So we should go to the market there to sell our products. But if we want to sell our products there, we have to know those players in the East Asia. And of course, in East Asia, the most important player is China. And that's why, guided by this motivation to sell products to East Asia, the EU started to say that we should develop a closer relationship and we should know China better. And of course, China at that time already started to have reform policy, uh, well, already engaged in reform for about uh, 17 years, because 15 years, 15 years. Uh, because Chinese reform started at the end of 1978. 19, at the beginning of 1979. So by 1995, it's about 15, 16, 17 years. And so China already was on the track of reform, and the EU had the expectation that with China's reform, it would not be only in the economic field, but also in the political field. And that's why in the EU's policy papers towards China, it always included an objective which said we would like to help China to transform into a civil society, an open society, based on the rule of law with respect to human rights. So that is always included in the EU's policy uh, objectives. And what is interesting is that three years later, and you may know that Brussels is a place where a lot of papers were produced. It's um, tons of papers, not virtual, I would say. Only, you know, if you see papers in the parliament, in the commission, you know, full of papers. And each document has to be translated in more than 20 languages. And how many papers have to be, to be used, you know, how much paper has to be used. And then, in terms of relationship with China, the EU since 1995 has been quite active. Three years later, the EU said, well, we would like to publish another policy paper which, based on what we did in the past three years, we should project to the future uh, our, you know, our relationship, and we would like to build a comprehensive partnership with China. So around the 1990s relationship between the EU and China was very positive, very hopeful, very active uh, reaction uh, between interaction between uh, the EU and China. So building a comprehensive partnership. So in other words, the EU somehow regarded China as a partner, and a partner comprehensive. What is comprehensive? It's not only economic, not only trade, but also people to people, let's say, also culture, history, social, all kinds of fields that the EU would like to uh, bring itself closer to China, to have a more comprehensive partnership. And so up to then, the Chinese still didn't react, <coughs> didn't react, 
But in the meantime, EU-China relationship started to develop more rapidly than before, than before 1995. Uh, for example, in 1998, that was the year EU-China summit mechanism was established. Before that year, there was no summit mechanism. There was a certain uh, level of dialogue, but rather at a low level, lower level. But then since 1998, it was historically uh, important year that the EU-China summit was established. And of course, for the EU-China summit, uh, just like the EU summit, it's the highest level summit between you and China. It's very, very important. But you uh, may not know who uh, represents the EU, who represents China, if we call it a uh, summit. Particularly from the Chinese side, you may not know that, although we call it summit, it is not Chinese president who will take part in the summit on behalf of China. It's the Chinese Premier. And so within the Chinese decision-making system, you should know that the Chinese President is the leader, the number one leader in China. And then below the Chinese President, there is Chinese Premier, who guides, who leads the State Council. <coughs> so Chinese Premier is under Chinese President. And then particularly in China, the situation is very special because the Chinese President is in the meantime the party secretary, general party secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, and in the meantime, the chairman of Central Military Commission. So in other words, the Chinese president is not only the president of the whole governmental bureaucracy, but also the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, because the Chinese Communist Party is the ruling party, and in the meantime, the chairman of the army. So it has the party's power, it has the army's power, it has the government's power. All the power together in the hands of Chinese president. So you can understand how Chinese president, how important he is. Uh, unfortunately, that's why I said unfortunately, that um, the EU-China summit, it caused the summit, it's caused the summit, but it's not really from the Chinese point of view, it's not the Chinese number one who participates in the summit. Why? You may be disappointed if I tell you. Um, because in Chinese foreign policy agenda, uh, who is the most important player in the world? Can you tell me? Can you guess? The United States. The United States is the most important player. That's why in Chinese foreign policy agenda, it's not a surprise that the Chinese president should deal with the United States. And the EU is less important compared to the United States, but still very important. That's why Chinese premier deals with the European Union. So that's a tradition in Chinese foreign policy uh, field that the Chinese premier has the task to deal with EU-China relationship. Um, what is interesting is in 2003, so another five years passed, but during the five years I have to explain to you because the, China, the European side since 1995 said, well, every two or three years we will publish a paper so that we will evaluate what we did in the past and we will uh, look forward to the future. In fact, after 1998, the European Union published two uh, evaluation papers in 2000, 2001 to evaluate what had been doing and whether it was satisfying or not. And then in 2003, 2003, the first half of 2003, uh, something happened. Uh, do you remember in the first, well, do you, you are too young to remember maybe. In 2003, the first half of 2003, Iraqi war. The United States took the unilateral action to go to Iraq and then the Western European countries were not happy about it and somehow the European Union was split at that time. Um, and then the Chinese government was very happy to see that there were some problems within the EU, and particularly there were some problems between the EU and the United States. So transatlantic relationship was not as solid as before. And then the EU and China became closer against this background, and they established 
strategic partnership in that year. Strategic partnership. But of course, when we say strategic partnership, it's one level higher compared to comprehensive partnership because strategic partnership has the nature of strategy, you know, strategic forward looking, the UN China should cooperate together. But you have to understand this strategic partnership between UN and China was established against the specific background of Iraqi war, against the specific background of the split between the, the European Union and the United States. But then in the latter half of 2003, the European Union and the United States started to repair their relationship, and then they would like to bring the relationship back to the normal track. And therefore, in November, you know, the European Union published a security strategy and saying that you know the United States is the most important player. Although you know we should, uh, the United States should know that it cannot do anything or everything alone. We should be able to help the United States. And so the relationship was repaired. But then the re the problem between the U.S. and China is they declared, they declared, they established strategic partnership. But what can be put on the agenda of strategic partnership? It became a problem. And then they realized that, well, they, they didn't, in fact, have such a deep relationship that could be called strategic. And then they started to establish a dialogue, which is called strategic dialogue. And that's why a, a British scholar asked a very interesting question. He said, well, you know, if the UN and China already establish a strategic partnership. And then why they suddenly realized there are so much, so much problem and then they started to establish a strategic, strategic dialogue. Is that right? Or the, you know, normally maybe you should establish strategic dialogue first to settle all your strategic common interests and then you realize that indeed you are strategic partners and then you can declare that you establish this partnership. But somehow two sides, the two sides were too eager to come closer. But then once they came closer, they realized that there is still so much difference that they have to settle before they can really address each other as close as possible as strategic partners. And so that's why somehow started from 2003 we already saw gradually problems between the UN and China. That they both had the intention to come closer. But due to the big difference between themselves, and then some of the difficulties they, they have, they really have problems to overcome. And gradually, 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 there had more and more problems between the UN and China. So what happened? 2003, um, after 2003, they established the strategic dialogue in 2005, and 2005 was also a very, very important year in uh, EU-China relations, because, um, you know, China used to be a developing country, although Chinese government still claims that it's a developing country, it's more disputed nowadays, it's not a common sense like in the past. But Chinese, China used to be a developing country, and that's why as a developing country, between the developing country and developed countries, there was um, regulated by the WTO that uh, there was a quota system for the developing countries to export textile products to the developed world. And that quota system was abolished in 2005, agreed by the members of WTO, and of course, that was done in uh, 1995 in the world way around, and uh, uh, and then uh, the EU members, the EU member states agreed to upgrade their own textile structure, industrial structure, to uh, be ready for the moment that the quota system would be abolished. Because if the quota was abolished, then it means that the developing countries can export freely to the developed world. But of course, like Italy, like France, like uh, many other European countries, they also have their own textile products. But with the competition from China, somehow this is very, very um, destructive. 
So what happened in 2005, on the 1st January 2005, after the quota system was abolished, suddenly Chinese textile products <laughs> all came to the European market and then disturbed the market completely. In three months, the European Commission received a lot of complaints saying that we cannot stand Chinese exports anymore, you know, Chinese imports anymore. We, we have to dis discuss with the Chinese government, you know, we have to find a way to deal with the problem. And so another problem in 2005 was the arms embargo lifting. Um, Chinese um, government, <clears throat> due to what it did in 1989, the European Union together with the United States, with Japan, with Australia, uh, uh, announced that they would introduce arms embargo against China. And this arms embargo up to now is still valid. And arms embargo, in fact, is from the Chinese side a very serious problem because if the European Union really treated China as a strategic partner, it should have lifted the arms embargo. Um, that's why the Chinese argument after 2003, now since you agreed to uh, be strategic partner uh, with us, you should agree to first lift the arms embargo. And from 2003 on, there was discussion within the European Union, uh, different member states, of course, had different attitudes. But in the first half of 2005, particularly, let's say, in the first month of 2005, it was seemingly possible that in the first half of 2005, the arms embargo would be lifted. At that time, Javier Solano <coughs> was the high representative and then we send a message to the Chinese that it's possible because more and more countries tended to agree that we could lift the arms embargo. But what happened was the American president at that time was Bush. Bush himself flew to Brussels. Zolik himself flew to Brussels saying that you cannot lift the arms embargo for China. If any American soldiers were killed by European weapons, bought by China in the cross-strait conflict. This will not be accepted by American government. A very clear message sent by American government to Brussels that the EU cannot lift the arms embargo. And facing this pressure, the Commission was in a, the Council was in a very difficult dilemma. And then in March in China, at the National People's Congress, the Chinese government said well, we passed the anti-cessation law against Taiwan. So anti-cessation law includes 10 articles, and one article said in case Taiwan declared independence, the mainland of China would have the right to use force to uh, you know, reunite the whole country. And then, of course, this makes the EU feel that, well, you know, we cannot lift embargo uh, under the pressure of the US with the Chinese uh, newly uh, approved legal document, and so the arms embargo finally was not lifted. And so in the first half of 2005, you could see more and more problems. And then in the meantime, trade deficit between India and China had also been growing more and more rapidly, because Chinese uh, trading power had been growing more and more rapidly, and then between you and China, the total volume had been growing rapidly, but in the meantime, Chinese surplus in trade with the EU had also been growing rapidly. And then some of the member states uh, facing great pressure, and then they complained to the Commission that we have to take measures. And so in 2005, gradually, you feel that the atmosphere between you and China had been changing more towards the direction of negative Know, negative um, relationship. And then against this background, in 2006, the EU published another paper. And this paper, uh, in fact, <coughs> is different from the previous ones because the previous papers was only one paper. I call it one, it's just one. But this paper, we call it one, but it's composed of two. Because one paper, which covers all the aspects of EU-China relationship, uh, it's called Closer Partners Growing Responsibility. And then there is a separate paper prepared by DG Trade of the European Commission, separately focusing on trade investment relationship. And then in the doc document, the EU, for the first time, 
made very clear, saying that China is the most serious threat for the EU in terms of trade. So you see the tone has been changed completely from comprehensive partner, long-term partner, to strategic partner, and suddenly in 2006, 10 years later, more than 10 years later, and then the EU said China is the most serious challenge of trade. So China becomes a challenge instead of a good partner. And then what is interesting is, you see the rhythm. The EU promised at the beginning every two or three years, and then finally, after 2006, the EU waited for 10 years to produce the most recent paper, that was in 2016. Why? Of course, there were different reasons. Um, after 2006, um, the EU, inside the EU there were also reforms, the Lisbon Treaty. First, the treaty constitution had problem because in 2005, also in the first half of 2005, the treaty constitution was, was um, <laughs> destroyed, let's say, uh, by the French and uh, the Dutch uh, referendum. And so the treaty constitution became impossible and then they had to find other solutions. And then until uh, the member states found this Lisbon Treaty and ratified the Lisbon Treaty. But when the Lisbon Treaty became ratified, there was a big reform inside the European institution. In the past, all these policy papers were issued by DG Trade together with DG Relax in the European Commission. But then <coughs> after the Lisbon Treaty, DG Relax disappeared. And then the European External Action Service was founded. And so um, the European External Action Service is in charge of external relationship. DG Relax is gone. And so there are, there are a lot of um, officials working in the Commission. At that time, in fact, they didn't know, due to the reform, what they would, going to, what they would be uh, going to do. Uh, whether they still continue to work on the profile of China or they would be sent to somewhere else. And so there was a lot of uncertainty. And then it took several years for the uh, personal relationship was uh, regulated within the Commission. And then, of course, the uh, financial uh, crisis. The economic financial crisis after 2008 also started, and then 2012, 2013 even became more and more serious in the Commission because they had to deal with the debt countries. And a lot of things had to be regulated, and they didn't, they couldn't have time to give to EU China relationship. And I remember very clearly that uh, at a certain moment uh, for EU China summit, Martin Schulz scheduled meeting with Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. He couldn't even meet him just because of more urgent issues to deal with that of some of the countries. And so Chinese Premier arrived, but the whole morning didn't have anything to do because his counterpart was not available. Uh, so you could see during all these years, the relationship between you and China was not a major task for the European Union because they were more concerned about what happened inside the EU. And then, of course, after financial crisis, economic crisis, and then the refugee problem, the Brexit issue, the EU faced a lot of challenge, internal challenge. And then this also affected, somehow, uh, EU-China relationship. So, finally, uh, after 2014, the new uh, leadership of the European Commission came into place. They said, well, we should uh, you know, uh, now think about what we are going to do globally, regionally, and so that's why they published a serious paper on trade and security global policy, and then they started to work also on China. And that's why this element for a new EU strategy on China was in place. But of course, um, if you look at the titles, you would see that the last one is with the least inspiration. <laughs> because from the long-term policy <coughs> to building a comprehensive partnership to material partnership to closer partners, growing responsibility, finally just elements. Just elements. So it means that the EU realized that, well, although we have high expectations, we have um, some of, you know, good idea to establish or to develop relationship with China, but we have to stay, keep our foot, feet on the ground. And then we have to evaluate all these elements that are important, from norms, values, to political standards, to political system, to economic 
uh, practice, mechanisms, so a lot of things that have to be dealt with. And so this is a general background on uh, the policy paper from the European side. And then from the Chinese side, I will make it simple because up till now there are only two papers published from the Chinese side. One was uh, in 2003. So the European Union published its policy paper in 2003 on the 13th of September, and then the Chinese side published its paper just one month later on the 13th of October. 2003 as a reaction. So it shows that in 2003 that was indeed the best year for EU-China relationship. The relationship was really good that they could really regulate even their how they would publish their policy papers, how they would strengthen their cooperation. Uh, what was interesting, why I have to mention this, because although this is the first policy paper from the Chinese side and a very short policy paper, it includes very important three bullet points. And if you see the three points, and then you will see that the first point is to talk about EU-China political relationship, and then the second one is to talk about economic <coughs> relationship, and then the third one is to talk about culture, people-to-people -people relationship. So, in other words, up till now, if you look at EU-China relationship, there are three pillars. One pillar is economic, uh, sorry, the first one is political, political, and the second is economic and sectoral dialogue, sectoral dialogue, and third one is people-to-people -people dialogue. So the three pillars. But the third pillar, so the first pillar was established in 1990s, uh, and then the second was also in 1990s, but the third one was only established in 2012. And the Chinese paper was published in 2003. So which means that 10 years earlier, before the third pillar was established, Chinese government already had the idea, had the vision that between India and China, apart from the top-down relationship, we should also have bottom-up relationship. So it means that people should be involved. All of you should be involved. It's not only between diplomats, politicians, businessmen, but also between students, scholars, you know, ordinary people, tourists. Um, and then the second paper was uh, only in 2014. 2014. And what was also interesting from the Chinese side, as I said already to you that the European Union is not the top uh, important player in the Chinese radar of diplomacy, foreign, foreign policy. And that's why um, in the first paper in 2003, when China had the best relationship with the EU, in its uh, policy paper it said, oh, in five years we will publish the second EU policy paper. Five years, 2003, it means 2008. But China didn't do it. And China waited 11 years before it could have the second paper. And, and here I had to say that this policy paper was published on the 2nd of April. 2004, and on the 1st of April, Chinese president went to the College of Europe. The Chinese president went to the College of Europe in Bruges and delivered a speech on EU-China relations. And in his speech, he said, by the way, I would like to mention that a new EU policy paper will be published very soon. I said, oh, a new EU policy paper will be published. I have been waiting for a long time. When will it be published? And then I asked to the Chinese mission uh, diplomats, and they said, tomorrow. I said, oh, <laughs> that's really soon. Chinese president announced that it will be published very soon. Indeed, it's very, very soon. So he gave the speech on the 1st of April, and then he got the policy paper on the 2nd of April. And in the Chinese policy paper, it, it's not like the European policy paper, very much detailed, addressing all the different fields. Um, but it's more in general, you know, we should establish four partnerships, peace, growth, reform, and civilization. Well, if you talk only about these four domains, nobody will object, will oppose it, because of course these four are important. But of course, if you talk about how the UN China should cooperate, what are the differences between them, and then of course you will see a lot of problems. And then an analysis of EU-China relations. Um, I also mentioned already just now that before 1995 it was rather slow 
And then after 1995, it was quite uh, rapidly developing, particularly between 1995 and 2003. Um, they were somehow mutually attracted, and then they, they developed a mutually beneficial relationship. At that time, both sides seriously believed that this bilateral relationship was beneficial. The EU was happy in its relationship with China because the EU was happy to get the Chinese market. And the EU was happy to see China has been reforming rapidly. And the EU hoped that China would reform to the direction that the EU expected. As I said, towards the direction of an open civil society based on the rule of law with respect for human rights. So these are the values the EU expected that the Chinese government would take. Um, but somehow, um, this, this um, normative values were not taken by the Chinese government. And particularly nowadays, the European Commission or the EU in general has realized that uh, EU has too high expectation. Uh, the Chinese simply didn't follow the EU's expectation and will never be in the way that the EU expected China to be, what China to be. So the Chinese follow their own road, and the Chinese follow the road which can be labeled always as a road with Chinese characteristics. Uh, that's why this road with Chinese characteristics is different from what EU expects. And, uh, and then I will try to explain to you the problem. Um, first of all, the economic relationship. Um, we can see that um, China's trade surplus has been growing. Uh, the Chinese trade surplus only declined in 2008-2009 because uh, the EU had serious economic financial crisis. And then after that, it gradually came up and now getting uh, increasing again. So in 2013, it was back to 131 uh, billion euro, and then in 2006, um, it was back to the level before the European economic crisis, 175 euro, uh, million euro. Um, and then in the meantime, due to the Chinese uh, steel export uh, to the European market, more and more uh, concerns have been risen to the Commission that uh, China is dumping its overcapacity. This overcapacity issue, uh, as uh, now the Trade Commissioner, uh, Malmström, said, China is one of the countries where there is dumping and where we think they are not playing fairly. In the most recent uh, summits from 2016 to uh, 2017, 2018, both sides always talked about the overcapacity issue. So the overcapacity issue has been on the agenda of EU-China summit for three years. Um, but up till now, the EU has not been satisfied, although the Chinese side promised that we will deal with the issue. It takes time. It cannot be over you know, all of a sudden because overcapacity, uh, it involves a lot of uh, enterprises, a lot of employees. It's not easy just to deal with, to get rid of the issue overnight. Um, and then um, Chinese investment, that's an, a new phenomenon. Um, during all these years, uh, from the 1990s on, the European Union had been a very important investor in Chinese market, and particularly, particularly from technological point of view. Uh, the Chinese uh, always like EU technology, and then they like to introduce EU technology to Chinese market. They like EU investment to Chinese market. But somehow, due to, again, the financial crisis, um, some of the EU member states become weakened after that. And they desperately need investment. And then the Chinese uh, enterprises uh, went to EU and very, very rapidly uh, investing in uh, some of the industries. And then in 2016, the um, investment reached to uh, 35 billion euro, which was an increase of 77% compared to the previous year. So you could see that Chinese investment to the EU started almost from zero, and then suddenly it became very high. 
And then 2007, uh, it further grew to 65 billion euro. Um, this somehow alarmed the European Union, because if you talk about bilateral cooperation, it's fine, but of course the EU is also concerned about who benefits at the end. If Chinese investment comes, it's good, but if it goes to the merge and acquisition and takes all the technology back to China, then what is left in the European Union? So that's a big question. Uh, due to this reason, Italian, uh, French, and German ministers, industrial ministers, sent a letter, joint, a joint letter to the Commission saying that we should consider to introduce uh, uh, investment, foreign direct investment screening mechanism at the EU level. So currently, there is no such investment screening mechanism at EU level against the Chinese investment. Um, due to this uh, initiative by the three countries, the European Commission has been seriously considering this possibility and submitted the proposal to the Council, to the Parliament, and it's said that uh, the Council and the Parliament are considering very carefully uh, the content of the screening uh, mechanism and if it's fast enough, it will be out at the end of this year, otherwise it will be out early next year. So it means that by early next year, the latest, there will be a new document on China, which will screen Chinese investment to the EU. Um, and uh, last year, towards the end of last year, the beginning of this year, inside the EU, uh, there are several uh, research papers published by think tanks in, uh, in the EU, from Germany, from France, uh, from different countries, um, addressing to the EU audience that we have to be careful that China has become a threat. Um, so, then, so why the EU is so much worried about China, uh, about Chinese investment? It's uh, related to Made in China 2025. So Made in China 2025 is a document um, published by the Chinese government in 2015. So three years ago, the Chinese government said, well, you know, in order to stimulate our industrial technological development, we have this target uh, to be realized by 2025. And this, this is a strategy, strategic plan. And then it's a plan, or it's an initiative, uh, to upgrade Chinese industry. And in this plan, it says that um, the domestic content of poor materials should be increased to 40% in technology. And then that's by 2020, and then by 2025, when this document targeted in 2025, 70% of the technology should be owned by the Chinese. So it's a, it's a very aggressive plan because the European Union is worried that after 20, so before 2025, between the EU and China, everything should be fine because China needs the European co cooperation, needs European technology, but after 2025, that will be a big question mark. And so that's why the EU would like to cooperate with China, but keeps technology in its own hands. Uh, intellectual property uh, issue, the patent issue, they become very, very important nowadays. Um, and then, of course, the Chinese uh, didn't realize that the EU was so much concerned about it, and the, EU, the Chinese just thought, well, we are now uh, climbing the global value chains. And then when we climb the global value chains, we should, of course, upgrade our technological level, and then we should increase our capacity but then, of course, to increase your own capacity, somehow it poses competition between uh, China and the European Union. And that's why, um, due to all these reasons, when you talk about China with the European Commission, with uh, the EU institutional officials, they, the most frequently mentioned keywords are the following three. One is level playing field. So the EU, uh, believes that China is not playing level playing field in the sense that, well, China develops very rapidly nowadays um, in an unfair way because the Chinese government subsidizes particularly its state-owned enterprises. But uh, this is not the same uh, case in the European Union. 
And then another issue is reciprocity. Reciprocity, which means that you know the practice of exchanging things with others for mutual benefit. Um, so if China comes to the European Union to invest, the European Union generally is an open market. If without the screening mechanism, China can invest in all the you know countries, member states, without much barrier. But for European enterprises to go to Chinese market, it's not the same. And some of the sectors are not, not completely open. So market access is an issue from the European side. And that's why the European Union said, well, we talk about reciprocity in the sense that if you open your market completely to us, we will open our market completely to you. And if nowadays, like what is right now, that we completely open our market to you, but you don't open completely your market to us, and then we will somehow be obliged to close some of our sectors to you. So that will be the result of the screening mechanism. Then if you come to invest in us, we will see which fields that you can invest, to which degree you can invest, and then we will uh, set, uh, you know, um, the rules. And then transparency, another uh, key word, transparency. Transparency, uh, somehow this is a very, very interesting word because the EU always wants to know what China wants to do, what Chinese enterprises want to do in the European market. But this is a very difficult question because China is such a huge country and China has so many enterprises and China has so many different sectors. And if you ask the Chinese leaders whether they know what their enterprises are doing, I don't think it's easy for them to answer the question. Within China, transparency is a huge issue. It's very difficult to realize transparency. And that's why it's very difficult for China to be completely open and to become transparent to the European Union. And that's why I think it will still take a long time for China to really become transparent. And then talking about transparency, uh, what is interesting is uh, another key uh, term in EU-China relations nowadays is the Belt and Road Initiative. So the Chinese government uh, proposed this Belt and Road Initiative in 2013 uh, and then uh, published a policy paper in 2015. And then from the European side, there's only an official uh, reaction to the Belt and Road Initiative in 2017 when uh, the Vice President uh, of the Commission, Katani, uh, went to China to participate in the Belt and Road Forum, the Summit Forum. And then he proposed a dozen of European Union principles. And among the principles, reciprocity and transparency, are the most important keywords. Why? Because the European Union said, well, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative sounds very good because for us what is important is infrastructure construction. If the Chinese are eager to come to the European Union to engage in infrastructure development, it's good. But on the other hand, how the Chinese will do it? What kind of rules the Chinese will follow in engaging in these uh, construction projects? That's very important. And so that's why they want to know all these issues in detail. But of course, the Belt and Road Initiative is a very, very huge initiative. It will take 40, 50 years to be completed. And if you ask the Chinese leaders, can you tell me more in detail? I don't think they can. <laughs> I don't think they can. That's why it's not because they don't want to tell you know, what the Belt and Road Initiative is about. It's just because I don't think they can tell because they don't even have a very clear idea. And that is, I think, a very important difference between the European Union and the Chinese with doing things. Because for Europeans, when do things, they would first like to have a plan. And then they, well, let's say, they first have an objective. And then they develop an action plan. And then they develop steps. And then they make it very in detail, very much detail. Uh, you know, there's a Gantt chart, you know, in which month that you would do what and then finally you will start to do it. But before you do things, you may spend four or five years to prepare for that. And then the Chinese would say, let's do it first. And then by doing it, we try to find problems. And so there is a very famous saying by Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping, 
uh, crossing river by touching the stones. So we don't know how deep the river is. Let's go to the river. And then as long as we feel the bottom of the river, we will not be drowned. So they are not completely certain what is in front of them, but they just want to do it, to go ahead and to do it. But then the European Union said, no, we have to be ready. Everything has to be clear before we can take the first step. So that's the big difference between the Chinese and the Europeans, and that's the difference that leads to some of the difficulties between bilateral relations. Um, and then, of course, there are other problems between you and China. As I said, China used to be a developing country and used to be agreed to be a developing country. And now China still claims that I'm a developing country, we are a developing country, but it's not agreed anymore, particularly by uh, European Union countries, by the United States. Uh, they, they don't seem to agree anymore that China is now a strong economic power. It, should be treat, it shouldn't be treated anymore as a developing country. Um, and, uh, and then how to deal with this complicated nature? Um, it's, of course, uh, the Chinese said, we are economy, we are market economy. And then the Europeans said, no, you are not market economy yet. There was a big problem between EU-China relations in uh, 2015, uh, 2016. Because in 2001, China joined WTO. On the 11th of December, I think, on the 11th of December, China joined WTO in 2001. And then in the uh, term, when in the document that China joined WTO, it says, in the protocol, it said, well, uh, China needs 15 years as transition period. So 15 years as transition, which means that by 2016, China will be, uh, you know, past this transitional phase. But without the transitional phase, China could be treated by a non-market economy. And then after the 15 years, the Chinese government understood that after the 15 years, it will be treated as market economy. But, of course, the Article 15 of the Protocol of China's accession to the WTO was written in a rather ambiguous way that you can say, yes, indeed, China should be treated as a market economy after 2016. And then the Americans would say, we understood it differently. It's not without any condition. So if China behaves really like a market economy, fulfilling all these rules, we will give market economy status. Otherwise, we will still hold it as a condition that we will not recognize China as a market economy. So that's why there was a big debate in 2015, 2016, because China wanted it, and the EU and the United States didn't want to give. And finally, it didn't give to China, and then, of course, uh, the two sides were not happy about it. Um, and then, of course, uh, why China want it? Because if you look at the history of China, China developed from a very weak position, a developing, a much lagging behind player in the international system, gradually climbing up to become a more and more important player. And so, in the past, China was a rule taker. All the rules made by other countries in the international system, China had to follow. And now China said we are strong enough, we have contributed a lot to international development, to economic growth, and we should have the right to also to say you know, what we should do and we should have the right to, to, participate, to participate in rule making rather than we simply behave as a rule taker. Of course, if China is a player the same as all the other Western players with the same normative values, with the same political system, it's not a big issue. The big issue here is China is a different player, completely different player, completely coming from a different background, with a different history, with different value systems, with different economic model, with different political system. And now, of course, if you give the right for China to make rules, and then it will challenge the whole international system. So that's the most important question. And this question, of course, will not be solved easily. And that, of course, also lays between the UN and China, and it's not uh, going to be solved in the, in, the, in the coming years. 
And then how China perceives the EU. So I talk a lot about EU-China relationship, about problems. And then, um, so for the Chinese, European Union, first of all in general, uh, the, the Chinese uh, really like Europe very much. And they um, would like to copy even some of the European development models uh, and bring them to China. Um, and from the very beginning of European integration, China was a supporter. So China strongly supported European integration. China strongly hoped that the European Union would be a strong player in the international system. Even up till now, China hopes that the EU can be a stronger player. Um, but on the other hand, if we talk more in detail, um, I can tell you very frankly that if you look at Chinese publications on the European Union, uh, before the economic financial crisis, before 2008, all the publications on the EU was positive. All of them were positive. China only published positive news on the EU because they really liked the EU model. But after 2008, this situation was changed. After 2008, uh, because China sent also more and more journalists, correspondents here in the different member states of the European Union, and they observed a lot of problems, particularly economic problems, uh, social problems, uh, employee issues. Uh, uh, that's why they reported more and more problems to the Chinese readers that saying, well, the European Union faced challenge. It's facing challenge. The challenges are endless, all kinds of challenge. Uh, not only in the economic and financial field, but also the refugee crisis, but also terrorist attacks, but also Brexit issues. And then the Chinese said, well, what's going on in the EU? Why? Why do they have so many problems? And then the Chinese said, uh, well, you know, the problem is the EU is too big. <laughs> the EU has so many member states, and those member states cannot speak with one voice. And so the EU is weak. The EU is very weak. Although China would like the EU to be a greater player. Why? First of all, why China would like to be to the EU to be a great player? Because China doesn't like to listen to the United States. China doesn't feel comfortable if the United States is the only you know, hegemonic power. And China doesn't feel comfortable. And then China said, well, if the world in the future is a multipolar world, not only the United States, but the European Union, and other countries like Japan, you know, Canada, and other countries can all play together and making rules together. It will be international democratic situation. You know, that is what China wants to see. But unfortunately, to China's dislike, of course, the United States is always there. It's always very influential, very powerful. Particularly nowadays, Trump is very dominating in the international system. Always American first. So China said, well, you know, we really hope that the EU can work together with us, but, but it's not possible. And then, even, even though, uh, up till now, uh, now, as I said, the financial economic crisis is basically over, uh, the EU is more or less out of the crisis, although, of course, there are still problems, but you could say it's basically out, it's not like 2008, 2009. And so, the EU model in governance is still a preferred model from the Chinese understanding. So I, uh, in Brussels, I regularly meet Chinese delegations coming from China, you know, trying to take uh, experience from the European side and then to bring them back to China. And uh, for example, before coming here uh, last uh, Thursday, I received a Chinese export studying a social development model social development model and they she published a book after studying in the European Union and published a book introducing the European model to the Chinese uh, ministries and they are somehow taking some of the elements and then the EU is still regarded as an economic and trade power because uh, from the trade point of view the three biggest trading powers in the world the United States the EU and China and you may know that between you and China, the EU is the largest trading partner of China, and China is the second largest trading partner of the EU, because the United States is the first trading partner for the EU. Uh, China is number second. And so, um, China cannot speak with one voice, 
And this uh, China, DU cannot speak with one voice. And what is interesting here is that not only China realizes that the EU cannot speak with one voice, the EU also knows that it cannot speak with one voice, and it's very frustrating. But then somehow, uh, in Brussels, um, in many of the conferences nowadays, China is criticized uh, to divide and rule the EU. For example, uh, some of the initiatives uh, created by Chinese government, 16 plus 1, uh, with Central Eastern European countries, China selected uh, 11 uh, member states of the EU plus five non-members of the EU and trying to uh, develop more uh, economic cooperation, infrastructure investment among uh, these countries. And then the EU, Brussels said, well, this is a divide and rule game, and then China shouldn't do that. Uh, and then from the Chinese side said, well, if you could not provide investment to some of your member states where we cannot. And so there are, there are many issues like this, but somehow China said, well, if the EU member states need investment, we can go there. We can go there and we can promote um, our investment to these countries against the background that the EU is weakened. And then now uh, talking uh, about the war, uh, trade war between the U.S. and China. Um, in the end of September, I uh, participated in a very high-level conference in Brussels um, with, uh, of course, some of the EU uh, uh, European officials, some of the economists, and also a, a delegation from China with uh, um, the governor of People's Bank, uh, so China's central bank, with uh, uh, the heads, the presidents of several top think tanks in China, and also with ministers of several uh, Chinese uh, government bureaucracies. They, they just came, they sent a message to Brussels saying that, well, um, we don't like Trump's policy and we want to cooperate with the European Union. And of course, the message from the EU is hesitating because it's not just because China sent a positive message to the EU saying that we want to cooperate now, let's cooperate. And then the EU would think more carefully because of investment issue, because of trade surplus, because of a capacity issue, because of non-transparency issue, because of so many issues, it's not possible that all these, issue, all these issues will suddenly disappear just because China said let's cooperate. So that's why. Um, if you talk about EU and China relationship, it's very, very complicated. Even if you have the will to cooperate, it's not easy. And then coming, I, I don't know what time is. Uh, you, have, you have some time. Uh, let me see. Yeah, half an hour. I have uh, half an hour. Yeah. So I can conclude. Then I give the floor to students. Yeah. So in, ten, in ten minutes. In ten minutes. minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, for the EU and China, if we have to summarize their relationship, I, I will not be able to tell whether they are partners or competitors. It really depends on specific issues. Um, first of all, if we talk about economic and trade, in the field of economic trade, I see a lot of cooperation. Uh, cooperation between not only at the EU level, between the EU and Chinese government, but also between member states level and uh, Chinese different pro provinces. A lot of projects, very constructive, very uh, well developing. And then from that point of view, I see a positive side of EU-China relationship. And then on the other hand, if you talk about trade, I also see a huge volume of trade ongoing every day. The value of trade between the EU and China every day is more than 1 billion euro. Every day, more than 1 billion euro. You see a huge volume. And that's why one of the high level uh, EU officials from the Commission said to me that between you and China, whether you admit or not, we have strategic partnership. But this strategic partnership is not in the political field, but in trade in trade. Imagine that 
EU is the largest trading partner of China. If the EU lost this China as a big trading partner, with which player the EU can sell so much things and to buy so much? And so this partnership is very, very important. It relates to every day how much food you can eat, you know, how much money you can make, because this is really related to your daily life. And that's why this is strategic. From that point of view, EU-China economically important, strategically economically important to each other. And China cannot lose the EU, and the EU cannot lose China as partners. So their close interdependent, interdependent relationship is irreplaceable. Even against the trade war of Trump between, uh, between Trump and China, um, this EU-China relationship cannot be shaken. Otherwise, both sides will suffer a lot. And, and the European Commission is very clear about it, and they said, you know, no matter how, what is happening in the world, what is happening in the world, the EU, the US, and China, the trade economic relationship should stay stabilized. Otherwise, it will be very, very problematic. And now we see the three players, only between you and China is still stable, but between China and US, it's really very, very much destabilized, and we don't know what will happen in the future. It's a very, very bad scenario, although the Chinese don't want to see, uh, maybe some of the Americans don't want to see either. It is Trump who pushes towards that direction, and then we will see maybe uh, it's a lose-lose situation for both the United States and China in terms of trade. And we have to wait and see. And then for the political model, uh, there, I would say there is more competition. There is more competition because they have different model. Uh, the, Fundamental difference is values. I, I, I would say that the Chinese official um, documents embraces as, embrace as well uh, human rights, uh, democracy, but in reality, the Chinese society is not as developed as the European civil society. Um, so that's why if you talk about um, the political model, the Chinese always would like to emphasize that the Chinese history is different. Chinese has history of thousand years of history of authoritarian control. And the Chinese society up till now is still the society that relies so much on this top level, I would say, top down model. Top down model. It's always whatever happened and then it goes to the officials and it will never think about how to uh, you know, uh, rely on our own rights and then to uh, get expression of our own rights. Um, so somehow the political model is different and it will not be easily changed. And, and I have to tell you that in Brussels there is a general disappointment that if in the past the European Union still believed that with Chinese reform China would be more open, would be more uh, receptive to other you know, uh, norms, values, which are different from the Chinese own values, now it's clear that China will never be uh, taken, taking the road proposed by the European Union. Um, no, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> because in, in Belgium, it's like this, it's arm, uh, arm, uh, fire alarm, and then we are obliged to all go out. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is a fire alarm, but that's Italy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Italian, uh, the solution of Italian is better than <laughs> the solution. <Yeah. laughs> because otherwise we have to stop everything. It's, uh, it's really, really annoying. Um, but so political model here is a kind of competition, I would say. The Chinese would like to insist its own model and uh, follow, continue to follow its own model. It doesn't want to be, um, let's say, uh, influenced or affected by the external model. But on the other hand, what is possible is dialogue. <coughs> what is possible is dialogue. Um, between you and China, for political dialogue, uh, there are well, I would not say only for political dialogue. Between you and China in general, uh, uh, well, you know, all the three pillars, 
there are in total 60, 60 uh, types of dialogue. So 60 types of dialogue covering, of course, political issues, economic issues, and people-to-people -people dialogue. And then in terms of political issues, for example, arms control, uh, uh, arms sales, disarmament, uh, regional security, uh, Middle East, Iran, you know, North Korea, um, uh, a lot of these issues are covered between India and China. And then, of course, human rights issue has also, uh, they have regular dialogue. And um, the dialogue mechanism is quite uh, developed. And last week I was in Geneva, and then uh, OSCE said, up to now there is no dialogue <laughs> between OSCE and China. I said, well, that's a different system, because China, if you look at what is interesting, I can tell you, the OSCE people were very disappointed last week when I was there because I told them that if you talk about European security, the Chinese immediately would go to European Union security and the relationship between the UN and NATO. The Chinese will never think of OSCE, what the OSCE has been doing. Do you know OSCE? Of course, you should know OSCE, but the Chinese don't know OSCE. <laughs> Because OSCE has no relationship with China, and that's why there is no publications, no analysis on OSCE, and no uh, no uh, interest in OSCE. And, and that's why when the OSCE said, "Well, can you do a research and let us know how much China's, uh, you know, uh, scholar uh, scholarly world uh, is concerned about OSCE?" I said, "Zero, <laughs> zero. And then why? Because the EU takes most of the concern from the Chinese side. If you talk about Europe, China equivalents Europe with the EU. Although the EU, of course, is not Europe. Europe is much bigger geographically. But for China, the EU is the most important player in the EU, uh, in Europe. And that's why when we talk about Europe, China would talk about the EU. That's that's a very interesting point. Um, and. As I also said, China somehow embraces the model of EU in governance, in uh, technological development, in uh, economic and trade development, and that's why there is a lot of potential still for the and China to cooperate to establish that. Uh, and then for global governance, uh, now we talk about global governance, uh, of course there is a, a, a potential to talk about cooperation, but in the meantime, as I mentioned, China wants to participate in rule making. Uh, for example, IMF, uh, the special drawing rights, the decision-making power. China wants to participate. And China established its, uh, its well, took the initiative to uh, create Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And that was the first initiative in the field of finance that China wants to say that we are now ready to participate in decision-making. And so global governance it can be financial governance, can be economic governance in WTO. China said we are going to uh, involve in WTO reform. You know, uh, for example, in uh, um, um, IATA, the, the even uh, international aviation organization, China said we would like to participate. You know, China is getting more and more active because it wants to, uh, to uh, let its voice to be heard by the other uh, players in the world, but of course whether China's idea will be taken or not finally by the others, that's a question. That's a question. It still takes time. Um, but all in all, uh, the current relationship between the U.S. and China, I would say China is getting more and more uh, assertive, more and more confident in projecting its influence all over the world, in uh, participating in the decision making, uh, but the European Union somehow is getting more and more defensive compared to the Chinese uh, recent uh, moves. Um, so that's why, um, for the moment, I would say um, China is eager to cooperate, but China has also to uh, make a compromise in terms of overcapacity, in terms of transparency, in terms of reciprocity of market access, in terms of... Uh, 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 intellectual uh, uh, property uh, uh, patents issue. So there are still a lot of issues. And then the UN and China, they have very regular dialogue. Um, next, no, not next week. 
Friday, Chinese Premier Li will come to Brussels again because uh, Thursday and Friday, so tomorrow, uh, yes, tomorrow uh, I will participate in this ASEAN, Asia Europe meeting economic forum that will be held in Brussels. And then Friday, there will be a uh, summit meeting. So Chinese Premier will come again. And then um, we'll talk about how the UN-China can facilitate bilateral cooperation against the trade war uh, between the United States and, uh, and China. So the conclusion is um, there is no black and white if you talk about the UN-China. It's not easy to summarize. They are partners, but in the meantime, they are competitors. And then you have to use your own eyes, your own mind to analyze uh, EU-China relationship. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Jean. Um, uh, first of all, the OSC is uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, for all of you who uh, don't know this. And um, so now the floor is open to your thoughts, to your questions. You can ask whatever you uh, never dare to ask on, uh, on China, Europe, and the mutual relations. So the floor is open. Yes, there is one question there. Do you prefer to collect some questions or to... Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I have a kind of double question, which is, uh, uh, what do you think the... Um, how do you think China would react to the screening uh, uh, of the European Union if they would introduce this uh, screening procedure? How do you think China would react to this? And... Um, the second question is related to the China's political system. Uh, like, do, uh, to what extent do you think um, that uh, the, the China is perceived as a threat because of its political regime, which, uh, at least to our eyes, may seem um, restrictive to some extent? Like, uh, for example, if I think about the uh, freedom to use the, the web, which is not as open as in Western countries. Maybe this gives us a perception of uh, uh, political closure, uh, which also contributes to 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 this uh, to the perception of China's threat. So, Trade relations. Uh, what do you think uh, are the, I mean the the sectors over which uh, China is more interested to export, and which could be uh, and which are our sector, uh, European sector that export the most in uh, in China, and how uh, complete liberalization of uh, of the of, of trade between you and China could affect. Uh, the macroeconomic balance of, uh, of Europe. Uh, so. Maybe let's start with these two and then. Okay. okay. Uh, concerning the screening mechanism, um, well, this is, of course, a purely European decision. China cannot do anything about it. Uh, but China is afraid, of course, um, because if the screening mechanism is introduced, Chinese government or Chinese enterprises uh, themselves who would like to in invest here are not clear to which degree uh, their investment will be blocked and uh, to which degree their investment will be restricted. And so, I, as far as I know, that they are following very closely um, the ongoing discussion between the Council and the Parliament, and also um, the uh, content of the current document. But somehow, I, because um, 
I myself also read very carefully uh, the document that is produce, uh, produced by the Commission, proposed to the Parliament and the Council. It's uh, the screening mechanism is not such. Um, I would say a document that can completely block Chinese investment because it's different from CFIUS of the United States because um, the screening mechanism, finally the decision-making right as to whether to accept Chinese investment or not uh, lies in the hand of the member states. So although the EU wants to have the screening mechanism at the EU level, the decision-making right is at the hands of the member states. So in other words, the member states, despite of the happiness or unhappiness of the commission, the member states still have the right to say, we would like to take Chinese investment. But of course, on the condition that they have to provide reasonable argument against the commission if the commission said you can't take Chinese investment. So they have to convince the commission the reason that they take the investment. So it only makes Chinese investment to the EU more complicated. But it's not completely blocked uh, to block Chinese investment. So that's why we still, in the future, have to say case by case, you know, uh, we don't know in which country, in which case, that will become a sensitive case. And the case, of course, why I say it's sensitive, the European conditions, uh, Commission said if it's uh, sensitive to national security, um, to, um, I think, mainly security-related or strategic sectors, and then we would review this investment. So how to define whether it's related to national security or strategic development, and then, of course, uh, each member state ha will have a different understanding. And then still, you could say that the EU is divided. The EU will not speak with one voice because member states may have different uh, decision-making uh, 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 results. And then concerning the Chinese political system, whether um, why uh, uh, it's uh, perceived as a threat, um, you mentioned that uh, Chinese people cannot get access for free on the internet for some of the web pages. I, I, I myself, uh, every time when I went to China, I had very unpleasant experience because I could never get access to Google. Uh, I could, ha I had problem to get access to my Gmail account, uh, and and then of course I couldn't check my email regularly if I I, I was in China. And then the only trick for me personally, uh, all the five-star hotels, you can get free access. <laughs> so that's why I went, if, if I really became desperate, I went to five-star hotels in the, in the bar, in the lobby, you know. <laughs> I was there to check my email. <laughs> um, so this, this is indeed very, very inconvenient. I complained to my Chinese colleagues in China, and then they said, well, what is interesting is the Chinese government has different policies. For, for ordinary Chinese citizens, you don't have access. But for university students, you have. So on the campus, you can have access to all the internet uh, web pages, uh, you know, Google, whatever, even Facebook, you could. Uh, but only on the campus for the purpose of research. But for ordinary people, you don't. You don't have the right. So when I stayed with my parents at home, I couldn't. But of course, if you, I, I don't have an account at, at any Chinese university. So my own solution is to go to Five Star Hotel. <laughs> well, um, of course, this seriously affected Chinese image uh, because uh, this gives an uh, impression to the outside that China is not open. Um, well, up till now, it is the situation. Um, China is not um, in the in the internet uh, point of view. It's not indeed. It's not open. And also, we have. I just showed Giovanni. Uh, we have our Chinese WhatsApp software. Um, almost all the Chinese use our uh, WeChat um, software to communicate. And then on the uh, WeChat pages, uh, some of the publications could be removed in a second if uh, the government thinks that this is not good. Um, this is the reality. Um, and then for the trade relationship, what uh, China exports to the EU, what the EU exports to China, um, 
Well, because as I said, China is now climbing the uh, ladder of value chains, but to a large degree, China still exports a lot of this uh, um, um, how to explain uh, low value added products, for example, textiles. China is a very, very huge exporter. Um, but then, um, on the other hand, um, China likes very much uh, European products with high technology. For example, uh, uh, German machinery, uh, uh, chemistry, uh, chemical industry, uh, chemical products, and the Italian leather products, the luxury fo uh, goods, you know, the high-end goods are very much welcome in China. Um, but then, um, one Chinese official argument how to make the balance is that if you lift the arms embargo, we can buy a lot of, uh, you know, highly sophisticated uh, products. <laughs> but of course, this is not possible uh, for the moment. Um, I, I don't see how uh, the trade uh, surplus or trade deficit can, can be brought into balance. But then, uh, one thing I have to mention here is that um, to understand the relationship, the trade relationship between you and China, you have to put the whole East Asia into the picture because China processed to a large degree the raw materials it bought from Southeast Asian countries. So China is a world factory. Um, so it bought all these raw materials and then to process them in China and then to sell to the European Union. So originally, those uh, East Asian, Southeast A East A Asian countries sold their directly their raw materials to uh, the European Union, and now they sold to China, and then China sold them to the European Union. So in other words, all these products that originally went to the European market now went to China, and then from China went to the uh, European Union, but counted as Chinese exports. So that's why if you put the overall picture of Asia-EU trade, you will see that in the past decade, the uh, increase rate is only 10%. So in other words, the trade deficit China had with EU was to a large degree the trade deficit China had with Southeast Asian countries. So that's a very interesting phenomenon. Okay, I, yes. Professor, I have a specific question about the EU's screening mechanism. Uh, I want to ask, what's the EU's attitude towards the um, merger and acquisition or FDI of the state-owned enterprises from China? Any other question? Yes, one there. Good afternoon. Um, you talked about playing by the same rules in commerce, and it made me think about um, workers' rights, especially in manufacturing, as we said that China is very um, committed in manufacturing products and is a global factory. So how is China tackling this problem, Is if it is tackling this problem? And is it um, an important uh, problem to play, to, to resolve, to be able to play uh, by the same rules in commerce, in international commerce? Thank you. Yeah. I can, yes, do, two years, two hours and Ah, there is another one. Okay, okay. Sorry. Um, no, no. If there is time after this question, also if you could tell us something about the situation in the South China Sea, and if the, I mean the, there's some kind of military implication or developments uh, uh, with the countries in the area, uh, if you can tell us something about it, also it would be interesting. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, for again, for the screening mechanism, how China uh, perceives this issue and Chinese FDI. Well, as I said, um, whether China, uh, how China perceives this issue is not an issue, because this is the EU decision. The EU will decide, you know, uh, 
whether Chinese investment can come or not. And then as to the merge acquisition, um, this I would say, um, I think in 2016, uh, the Chinese uh, Meidi merged uh, KUKA in Germany. That is a watershed event, because that event um, made the European Union realize that they have to protect their own technology. And simply merge and acquisition doesn't produce any um, uh, employment. And so um, the European Union emphasized that Chinese investments are welcome to the European Union on the condition that Chinese will employ a lot of people, uh, not only to buy technology. So that is uh, um, what the EU expects Chinese to do. Uh, and then talking about uh, the labor rights, uh, I would say that uh, in China nowadays it has been approved a lot that uh, Chinese uh, workers, they realize that they have the right uh, how many hours of working, you know, uh, the unit price of their labor has been improved a lot during all these years. And so uh, I would say the situation has been improved a lot. But on the other hand, um, it's different in the sense that here uh, people or workers, more specifically workers, they don't tend to work on the weekends or on the uh, public holidays and they would like to enjoy life together with their family members. But in China, it's a different situation, that more and more people still tend to, more and more, I would say, um, uh, still a lot of people tend to make more money on public holidays, on the weekend. They prefer to work harder in order to make money. And, and then, of course, this is related to their right. And, and um, there are a lot of these discussions and dialogue between the EU and China with regards to the labor rights issue. And um, I think the European Union is also clear about the Chinese situation and they, I don't think there is so much disagreement between uh, the two on this issue. As to South China Sea, um, you may know that China reclaimed a lot of land in South China Sea in some of the islands in uh, Spratly, in uh, uh, in in uh, in that area, um, current situation is quite stable. I would say it was more problematic in 20, uh, 15, 2016. Of course, most recently there was almost a collision between uh, U.S. ship and the Chinese. Um, but the Chinese, the reason that the Chinese reclaimed so much land in the South China Sea, I personally think it's because. Um, in the past, it didn't have the capacity to do it. But it always, when I was small in China, when I received education from uh, primary school, we were introduced in the map that the whole South China Sea belonged to China. <laughs> <laughs> so the Chinese people, they strongly believed that South China Sea is part of Chinese territory, but they didn't have the capacity to claim the territory, the sovereignty of the territory, just because they didn't have the technology. And now they have the technology, they just want to do it. So that's all. From the Chinese logic, it's very obvious. But of course, from the international uh, security situation, you could say that it's very complicated. And then from the neighboring countries of South East, and East Asia, it's also very complicated. And you also know that the reward between, I mean, the, the Philippines and the Chinese concerning the, the island issue, uh, that also was a, was a very big uh, issue in the, um, I think, last year. And then what was interesting that the EU External Action Service pro pro prepared a, a statement, and then some of the member states didn't want to agree with the statement. And of course, in that, on that occasion, um, the External Action Service said that's, a, that's another case that China successfully divided the European Union member states. So you see, it's uh, it's always very complicated. Yeah. Okay. So I think what time is it? Yes, our time is over. So thank you very much, Professor Professor Mengi.